Hello. Good morning. Uh, the first disclaimer is this is a filler talk. So the main uh, speaker is not uh, has some other engagement question. So I am giving a filler talk. And I have seen filler talks where the speaker just looks at the slide and keep reading the slide from top to bottom. That this won't be one of them. But uh, I don't know what the original speaker had in mind when, uh, when he basically prepared uh, uh, this uh, particular talk. So I'm giving what I think is uh, suitable uh, alternative to this. So topic today is uh, challenges in cosmological universe signal detection. Today is the last day of the five day conference. Uh, apologies for the broken voice. Um, so I think by now you understood this uh, community already has been sold to the point that we should do something called the cosmological 21 centimeter signal detection. That is a very important um, aspect of um, today's radio astronomy, low frequency uh, and uh, future endeavors. So <clears throat> to begin with, as for everybody, the work is mostly done by the students and we take the credits and we keep on doing some mundane stuff like writing proposals, funding and other things. So here are uh, some students who have already uh, graduated um, and they are well placed and some students who have already been giving talks in this particular conference and will be giving today. And also uh, a major part of the things by the upgraded GMRT uh, acknowledgement to the facility is a fantastic one run by NCRAT IFR and of course the CDUR uh, consortium, Indian consortium uh, mainly with uh, people who were mentioned there and I apologize if I miss somebody, the long list. Uh, I skipped the basic slide, this is what we do um, from the very uh, picture which we accept now for the study of uh, universe uh, structure formation starting from Big Bang. Uh, the universe became neutral, it has expanded, it was dark age, then the cosmic dawn when the first stars and galaxies come and the black holes and then finally the epoch of reionization where the universe became reionized uh, to so neutral fraction uh, goes from 1 to something around it is minus 3 over this extended epoch of um, um, covering dark ages, cosmic dawn and UR. <coughs> So this is uh, the area where we basically zoom in and lots of lots of uh, experiments are designed. Some of this talk will be overlapped with some each talk yesterday. Uh, but I will just break it up into three parts. First one is some work we have been doing uh, with the upgraded GMRT in the post your era so far. But I will show you some result and uh, later on Rashmi will show you some result where we are closely approaching this window and we are trying to uh, utilize GMRT in that band as well. But uh, then SK1 low, which is mainly for uh, design for doing the window of epoch of realization to cosmic dawn. And then finally, um, some space based observation to look at dark ages because dark age, um, the restricted signal kind of is below, comes to be below like less than 30 megahertz where our cyanosphere is uh, completely a big devil. It will not be possible for you to observe it from the ground. <coughs> so uh, maybe you have already seen some of the global experiments. So there are two ways to do this experiment. One is you have an all sky average signal uh, with a signal uh, antenna or radiometer. And there are fa fairly uh, large amount of things. Aegis was the first one to start this off uh, with Judd Bowman and uh, uh, Alan Rogers. And now they have gone to phase one, phase two, phase three. The only and the controversial result exists so far is from Aegis. Uh, I will not go into the subject of the result, but I must say that result <coughs> kept the field alive for another 10, 15 years. <laughs> that is so. SARS has gone through a lot of changes. It has gone through phase one, phase two. The recent one, which is on the lake, uh, mainly to counter the argument that uh, what AJ saw basically maybe 
Do you want to come? Uh, so what uh, edges uh, <coughs> uh, detected was basically not exactly coming from the sky but from the ground reflection. That is one interesting thing and I must have heard something about it before. And there is prism and there is reach. Uh, so there is a lot of new um, efforts going on. I will skip this. Uh, another way to look at this thing is uh, interferometric mode. So you are looking at spatial information of this uh, epoch and uh, that you do with the interferometer. So uh, GMRT, the initial work started with the elephants group of CETA and uh, then uh, uh, there were some upper limits on the polarized uh, emission. And then uh, the paper uh, was the first one from the US. Now it has developed into HEDA. Then there is LOFAR and MWA. So this is a broad list of what the upper limits are. I think they may, they may have gone through some more iterations and uh, more updates on this. But the point is that we have not even close to what the actual signals are. We are far away. And uh, this is not to, because of the sensitivity. This entire experiment is not sensitivity limited. It is systematically. Okay. So typically in a radiometer, you can basically come down by square root of n. Um, with n being number of samples, which is by either frequency or by time. And typically you can beat the noise if it is purely Gaussian. But if it is a non-Gaussian noise, that basically means there is something in your system which is stopping it to come down and integrate down and beat the uh, noise barrier. And that cannot be avoided even if you take more and more hours of integration. That's the problem in this kind of sim, uh, observations. <coughs> okay. So again, some more uh, upper limits which we have uh, recently uh, summarized in one of the uh, Journal of Astronomy, Astrophysics, special issue of SK, which will come out soon. Uh, but here we are all here for the telescope which is going to be built and India is a part of that consortium uh, is the SKA or SK phase 1. And there are two parts of it. One is the SK phase 1 low which is uh, relevant for our discussion today. But the other part is of course SK 1 meet which is going to be in South Africa. It's a big consortium, global partnership, lots of um, uh, Countries have joined in different level, uh, although it shows US, but US is not formally a part of it. But yes, some uh, contribution regarding software is currently being planned for CASA, whereby it is shown to be in blue. India is definitely part of it. Uh, we have to sign some agreement. Things are going on in top government level and uh, <coughs> I don't want to talk about it. So now, uh, so SK1 low is a kind of this kind of array. It is different from the typical array which you have seen, which is a dish array, which is GMRTs. Okay, so it is like a dipole array, antenna array. And each dipole, uh, you, have talk, you have seen yesterday's uh, talk by Prabhu. So each dipole, um, uh, a 256 dipole kind of um, uh, forms a, a big, uh, uh, what you call tile. And each tile has one uh, primary beam. So they phase up and we form one. So each tile is kind of equivalent to one kind of dish. <coughs> and uh, there will be 512 stations, with each of them having 256 log periodic dipole antennas. The coverage will be from 50 to 350 megahertz. So definitely you can see that dark edges won't be covered by this particular uh, telescope. <coughs> So yeah, uh, one thing, just a uh, digression from this, even if you do not like astronomy or astrophysics, still if you have some computing background or computer science inclination, this is an exciting project for them also. Because the point is that when we, I started the um, uh, astronomy uh, expedition, I remember I started my MSc uh, working with Rajaram and there the point was that you get one hour on telescope, you keep 10 backups of the data because you don't want to go back again on telescope. It's very difficult to run a telescope 
is costly. Here the point is, data rate is so much, it may be easier to reobserve something multiple times than to store the data for multiple copies. So the regime has changed completely from where we begin and now where it is going to be. So this is the problem. It is going to spill out. Currently, the UGMRT uh, observation for one night spills out like 1 to 1.5 terabyte of data. So six hours, 1 to 1.5 terabyte data. This is going to create such things per second. That's the problem. So <clears throat> uh, how to store it, how to take care of it, what is called distributed computing, uh, you know, uh, machine learning, all these things will come. What is a good data versus a bad data? Nobody has time to look at it. There won't be possible. Even still now, maybe, don't listen to this, my two students are there. We tell them to look at the data, find the bad data, it's not possible. So where we are going, it is not possible for them. It's so much heavy data that we have to really, cannot go back one by one and look at and flag out what is a bad data. You have to come up with some intelligent algorithm. <coughs> Sorry, someone? So, this is the uh, visualization how the layouts will be for SK1 low. And so, this is in the Peru, sorry, in Western Australia. So, um, uh, how you pack this 256 antenna over one tile of one kilometer is also, uh, sorry, over one tile is also another point of discussion. Because what we have is, recently we had a problem that uh, the response of the antenna uh, in this frequency range 50 to um, uh, 90 megahertz, there were a lot of ripples because of the fact that <clears throat> the antennas were very closely packed and there was cross talk or coupling, cross coupling. So, and those, uh, those resonances were coming out exactly around 75 to 80 megahertz, which we expect our signals to like. So, on top of uh, the expectation that our telescope will be sensitive, we also want the band path or the response of the telescope across the frequency range to be uniform. If it is not uniform, then it should be at least constant or should not change with time. Okay. So here there are a few problems. So engineers are working on it. How to come up with a better way to pack the antennas inside one tile. <clears throat> In the meanwhile, we just show that how our, uh, this is the sensitivity. Uh, in, uh, uh, in some unit meter square over Kelvin. Uh, this is the SK one mid, this is the one low, and here you see is a upgraded GMRT. So one publicity for GMRT is that till SK one comes up, which is another eight years from now, <coughs> this remains uh, the best instrument in the world to be operated between in this frequency range. So below one gigahertz, down to around say 300 megahertz or so. So use it and use it well. <coughs> now coming to the challenges. This is a slide uh, taken um, from uh, Florian Martin's uh, presentation recently. So I mean, um, you have this uh, dipole antennas. They are observing the sky. Okay. So the signal from the sky is coming through the atmosphere of the Earth, the ionosphere for this particular frequency range. So it gets corrupted. As you know, ionosphere is a um, a three-dimensional plasma layer. So as radio waves pass through it, it gets corrupted. And finally, nothing gets transmitted to the ionosphere if it hits below the plasma cutoff frequency. So but it becomes a kind of a corruption term to begin with. Then you have antennas which are receiving it. They have mutual coupling against each other. They have polarization leakage, cable reflection, variety of other stuff. And also what is called RFI or radio frequency interference. So we astronomers are shameless people. We want to observe at every frequency we can. But actually there is a uh, spectrum allocation committee international called ITU. Okay. They have some 
reserved frequency ranges for astronomical usage. Okay. So, 21 centimeter frequency, 1.4 gigahertz is restricted. There is nothing can come in that. But other bands are not. Okay. Uh, because there are transmissions for civilian usage, for military usage, and variety of others. Satellite downlink, variety of other things are there. Uh, so, but we, we can observe, we cannot transmit at those frequencies, like we can definitely see at those frequencies. So, what we shamelessly do is that we keep on observing at all possible banks, because that's allowed. But then these other things which are going on are kind of noise to us. So either we should know exactly how they are being transmitted or we should, uh, so that we can basically eliminate them from the data set. Okay. <coughs> so that's the RFI major problem. And then finally you have a receiver which digitizes, channelize and correlate. And then finally you have RFI flagging. Direction independent calibration, direction dependent calibration, and so on and so. We will come to that. So, each and every step of the calibration is important. The one thing to note is calibration is not independent of signal to noise, it is very signal to noise dependent. So, supposedly, the ionospheric time scales changes within few minutes. Okay. So, you have to calibrate within few minutes to get rid of the ionosphere. But then you cannot reach to the, the signal uh, level the, where we want to reach for the UR signals in that short period of time. And that is where you cause the travel to start with. So you have calibration, you calibrate in some time scales, but you don't calibrate after you have received thousand hours of data. You calibrate at much shorter time scales, whether you do an independent calibration or dependent calibration, whatever. <coughs> I skip that. So, okay, this is a nice slide to elaborate. So, here is the upper plot again taken from Florence talk. Uh, upper plot is uh, angular um, uh, plot. So, you have um, RA versus deck. This is the foreground, how it looks like. And then this is the diffuse foreground. This is the point sources, compact point sources. This is how the diffuse foreground looks like. And this is how instrumental effects looks like. The lower bottom half is basically how it looks as a function of frequency. So, extragalactic point sources are expected to be either very smooth over the frequency ranges, so does galactic emission. But instrumental effects can be frequency dependent, very strong dependency, like band pass can be dependent on the frequency. And you have 21 centimeter signal. So, what we are trying to do, either you can um, try to remove the <coughs> foregrounds, RFI, and uh, instrumental effects from the data to, to go back down to your signal, or you localize, separate out your signal from the data, from the other noise terms, if you can. So that was the, the second one is called foreground avoidance, and the first one is foreground subtraction, or you deal with something in between, a hybrid mode, which uh, Samir already mentioned, that is the kind of the way to go. So, another way to plot it, one thing to note is the all the foregrounds are few orders of magnitude brighter than the signal. So, if you are doing any calibration error, if you are making any error while calibrating the data, that is a function of the strength of the foregrounds. So, even if you make 1% error, of the calibration that is multiplied by the source brightness in the foreground. So, 1% may still be higher than the signal in the background. That's why it's a critical one. <coughs> this is another way of uh, showing the angular power spectrum, and this is uh, you can see what the galactic synchrotron radiation looks like, uh, extragalactic point sources, galactic free free, extragalactic free free. But here is our signal down here. So many orders of magnitude lower than the foregrounds. <coughs> now, foregrounds, so there's the importance to understand what the foregrounds are and how to characterize them better day by day. Now, the only problem is the we in order to do that, you need to have observation of the foregrounds 
in that same frequency range where you are going to get the signal. But that is the problem because the, in the same frequency range you may not have enough sensitivity right now or previously to build it up. So mostly it will rely on the previous surveys which may have been done at a higher frequency. So typically what we do is both. One, we start off having the a priori knowledge of the foregrounds from the existing surveys at a higher, higher frequency. Okay. And we scale down in the frequency or scale up the uh, synchrotron basically the power, uh, the um, flux density goes up as you go down in frequency. So if you know that a, in the approximation that the foregrounds are smoothly behaving as a function of frequency, you can take your data from the higher frequency and scale them up for the lower frequency and that becomes your foreground model to begin with. And as your telescope is taking more and more data, you form a better foreground model at the frequency where you're expecting the red shifted signal to be, okay. <coughs> so you do both. So there are several observations like there is all space survey in L band 1.4 gigahertz by uh, VLA. And there are uh, all sky survey in 300 megahertz also in some other frequency, other telescopes. And so with those kind of things, you can build up your uh, uh, information about the foreground, nature of foregrounds, what can it be? Also, there are several deep fields like Cosmos, LIS, North One, S1. Uh, there is this um, XMLSS. There are several such deep fields where we have not only good data in radio wavelength, but also in other multi-wavelength approach like X-ray, optical, and variety of other things. So those are the fields from where you can actually start characterizing your foregrounds. This is one way to plot it. This is the DNDS kind of a log and log plot, accumulative distribution function, how the sources, number density of sources behave in each flux beams. Okay. <coughs> This is a um, slide of uh, RFI. So you can see this is uh, in, in GMRT, how this is a frequency axis, mainly from our work from 300 to 500 megahertz with GMRT band three. This is a function of time. And this is the, the third axis is the visibility amplitude. Okay, so you can see that anything which is varying so rapidly uh, cannot be something which is coming from the sky except this one or two occurrences of FRBs, but that, if you're anyway lucky. So that can be a nature paper, but this can be, this is the RFI which you have to come, take out from your data and uh, reduce data to get better results. So that's the RFI and the causes uh, for, <coughs> either it is caused within the array itself by some leakage from the electronic devices you're using in the array, in the receivers and other ways, or it can be genuinely some transmission which you don't want in your bag, but it is there. <coughs> so the, the other way is that you have uh, the interferometric observation. So uh, what we do is typically it's uh, in the image domain, you have the two sky uh, angular uh, axis, the array and the date and the frequency axis. If you do Fourier transform of that, then finally you go to something called the K-space. People have already discussed this, so we will not go in details. So finally you, uh, you uh, create your power spectrum, either spherically average power spectrum or the cylindrical power spectrum, where you have two different axes, K parallel and K perpendicular. So the idea is that if you have enough, uh, you can actually localize the foregrounds in the k perpendicular space more in the k parallel space more so nothing goes out of this particular thing called the wedge or the foreground wedge <coughs> and things are basically clean here but this is very idealistic any calibration error you are doing or you're having in the instrument will cause this thing to spill over and keep uh, uh, fading out your opportunity in the you are window space. And that's the more important thing to look out if you're going for foreground avoidance. <clears throat> Just to give you a brief hint of what we have, how we have started. So we chose one field called LIS North One, which is one of the um, 
multi-wavelength, uh, well-studied field in multi-wavelength. And uh, this is exactly in center of all these various uh, observations from different uh, multi-wavelength observatories. And we chose that. And so one of the early works of this in band 3 or 300 megahertz is uh, from, from Arnab's thesis, where we produce this deep image 15 microgenski per beam in band 3. And uh, 300 to 500 megahertz, not quite into UR, but it's kind of say post UR. But when we did that, the band 2 was the 150 megahertz band of GMRT was not available. It was going to some upgrade and still not sufficient and then we were not present to have any meaningful constraint on the foregrounds. So we said, okay, we will do it in a little bit higher frequency and assuming that the foregrounds are kind of smoothly behaved in frequency, we will bring them down to carry forward our exercises of foreground removal. That was the case. <coughs> and uh, there are several uh, things we learned from the exercise is that uh, if you are near to the field center, your things are more or less okay. Still, you face some of these bright sources and where the errors grow. Okay. So, here, although we mostly try direction independent calibration, then you have basically one calibration per field. Uh, we, we still, we had the uh, impression that you cannot live without direction independent calibration because you need to uh, solve for these errors that you're making in the outer side of the field of view. So that was the final thing. And so they produced some result and uh, it already has been discussed as a part of the yesterday's two talk. So I skip that. One thing uh, we interestingly noted and can be verified now is that we, by doing this um, angular power spectrum of the foreground, which is one way to constrain what the foreground are and how they behave in the angular scale. What we <coughs> saw is that in this wide band of the GMRT, we saw some kind of a break in the spectral index. That is very unlikely, but because uh, we should expect turnover of synchrotron kind of a little bit lower than what we are seeing. So we saw that, we published that, but we still do verify with further and further more observations of, of uh, with the GMRT band 3, not only for this particular field, but for other fields also. That's in one of the wish list. <coughs> so let's keep that. Okay. What another thing we tried is uh, in this particular thing, as Samir also mentioned, uh, the TGE uh, group has a new solution. So when you do RFI excision, you keep, basically you have some RFI in a channel or a frequency channel. If you flag it, you produce blank channels. Any blank channel, if you do this Fourier transform in the frequency domain, will create a ripple that will uh, uh, completely uh, wash out your power spectrum, okay? So we'll deal with it somehow. So one way, uh, Samir mentioned about the TG and uh, also Sujita's work, how to deal with that in the delay space, uh, this uh, differential delay space. And here is one is you do like a one day clean algorithm and you basically uh, take care of this missing spacings. Same thing we do for interferometric imaging in two dimension when we have a missing baseline. And that was compared with this least square algorithm which uh, I think was used heavily with NWA and we have some comparison result. Uh, it's a good paper to look into. <coughs> and we find that uh, clean works good for some way, but LSSA or least square uh, algorithm uh, approximation that worked better in most of the other occupancy ranges of the RFI. So this particular result uh, from this band two, band three, sorry, uh, resulted in some upper limit of the post signal we have already seen that in the yesterday's two talk. So I will skip that. Just to leave you with this, that we have some upper limit on this delta square k in this uh, few uh, frequency um, redshift ranges, which are definitely post -year. So it's a talk uh, from the next, after the uh, lunch, but uh, I will show you that those were the results from the post -year. So we were mostly looking into frequencies which are 300 megahertz or higher. 
But we, uh, we started observing in band 2, which is the 150 megahertz band of GMRT, which is very relevant for the UR observation. <coughs> Initial, uh, our impact was that it started with RFI. The band actually was 16 megahertz band to begin with, but they expanded and made it wider, 120 megahertz to 240. And because of widening the band, they, we incorporated more out of the band RFI inside the band and we made actually make it worse. So with the first glance, when we took first eight hour data um, in the year of 2018 or 19, it was really bad. So we took 24 hours more data with that. And that produced this result uh, at uh, 190 megahertz, which is going to be a major part of the talk which Rashmi Sagar will give you after the lunch, after the lunch. Yeah. So I will not speak about it, I'll just show you. But the point is that we have now have to talk about direction dependent calibration, which is the which has resulted into this particular image. This image has reached 230 microjansky per beam, 220 microjansky per beam, which is kind of a factor of two lower than what GMRT is currently showing as their best achieved RMS in this particular frequency band. So it's quite good. And we will uh, wish to take it forward and do the usual things, and but more so in Russian stuff. <coughs> so that was the part where we are using real observation to understand and characterize uh, the major foreground challenge, okay, which is how do you constrain the foregrounds if you don't have a, bit, a better understanding of the foreground down to the level of the UR signal, you cannot remove it from the data set. So any improper knowledge of the foreground will create a bias, which will avoid, uh, obstruct the estimation of the uh, 21 centimeter signal. So our idea is to go as deeper as possible and, and remove the foreground as much as possible. So for that, you cannot just leave with observations. You have to create a simulation pipeline where you have to simulate and understand how these things work, how to develop better algorithms and so and so. So one work which has been led by Aishila and uh, is basically creating an end to end pipeline. This will also come in uh, Summit stock. So, initial results say that uh, basic calibration things like positional offset and our uh, calibration errors, independent calibration errors, uh, what is the limit? How much robust that calibration errors will be uh, so that we can, uh, we can uh, uh, unearth the invisible signal? <coughs> But the independent calibration errors, addition, independent calibration errors are the only one. There are a few more. And there is this uh, chromatic primary beam. There are this uh, RFI and this ionospheric FX. So one way to go forward is also you to use the ionospheric FX uh, to understand what are the limitations that poses. So ionosphere is this three-dimensional layer above the, ionos uh, above the earth. And any trans-ionospheric signals get modified mainly by phase. So it's a diffractive effect. So any phase error causes the the source to shift. So if you expected the source there, it may be like going there. And the ionosphere changes a function of time. So the source keeps on moving. So if you make an image of the uh, source after a while, it will may look a point source might look like a blob in the sky. That's the problem. So there are some initial results which look for some stock after the lunch where we are tackling that using this end-to-end -end pipeline. So we had main observation which has to be done to understand the foregrounds, the nature of uh, the other instrumental effects like HERA, I think you have heard maybe something. Uh, there are some cross-coupling issues. I showed you some issues with even the very initial deployment of the SKA tiles. We are seeing coupling issues which causing resonance in the band. <clears throat> then you have to actually create an end-to-end -end pipeline to model each of them okay, and understand how to mitigate that. Because with real data, you have so many other things, unknown parameters, you cannot do that. So now, those after those two, the third one is now, okay, you have all of those things. Now, how do you extract your signal out of that? Because some of those effects will be anyway uh, remaining in your data set. You cannot do with anything with that. So, one way is you keep removing one after the other, and another way is you estimate your signal in the data set 
in presence of all those terms, where you actually model those terms. This is what how you deal with in this um, recent jargon of machine learning algorithm. Basically, you don't remove anything from data, but you model the entire data set in terms of the foregrounds, the RFI, the calibration errors, and all those things, and see how you uh, extract the final signal. So that's the, how it is done. This is on Schumann slide. And so basically you have the same end-to-end -end pipeline, but now you take it up and then you use the algorithm to estimate the signal parameters. So one such result has been published uh, from Madhurima's work, where she has done some um, estimation of the, uh, your, the signal parameters in presence of four nouns. Okay, and that, that shows that our uh, extraction pipeline is robust against some variation in the foregrounds. But more will be coming after Summit's talk regarding how do you deal with ionospheric effects? How do you deal with the instrumental effects, uh, direction independent effects? And those are the work going on currently with Anshuman's thesis and Summit's work. <coughs> so this is the situation on the ground. You cannot avoid RFI, you cannot avoid ionosphere. So one ambitious thing to deal with uh, in just uh, have seven minutes, right? Yeah. In the last seven minutes is that you can avoid them if you have enough sufficient money and funding. If you go to the space above the ionosphere, uh, shielded from the RFI, and a good place for that is going to be in the moon, really going to the moon. Okay, so there are a few studies like that uh, from uh, University of Colorado under NASA. Uh, one is this landing on the far side and deploying some antennas on the far side of the moon. Recently, I learned there is similar exercise also going on in ESA in Netherlands. And they also have an astronomical uh, low frequency observatory on the far side of the moon under planning stage. And then DAPER is one such another concept. But um, this is not just, this was a kind of a wish, uh, wishy wishy dream uh, when I was a postdoc. Now, actually, this is becoming a reality. Come next year, there will be missions which are landing on the near side of the moon. And that actually will spread out antennas on the near side of the moon. So the first stage is going up already. Uh, thanks to these initiatives from um, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, the US is going back to moon for sure. And if you are noticing the work between uh, the Netherlands and China, uh, there is already they have landed one such thing on the far side. Now the results are not known, but it's okay. Uh, so I think this is not like a dream anymore. It's a dream which will become a reality very soon, maybe in a couple of years from now. So there is one placeholder here also, Pratush, which is a RRI-based initiative led by Saurav Singh and Mayuri. You must have heard about it in the first day when Mayuri was here. But I am involved in one such, another mission called SIMS, which is not, so Pratush's work is basically going to be on the, for the you are in cosmic dawn region. And SIMS is looking at things which are below 30 megahertz. Okay, so SIMS is a concept which has developed into a kind of prototype. And we have funded now for a PS4, a PSLV stage 4 launch to, uh, to fly a small deployer and to test the spectrum. It looks like this. Test the spectrum at below 16 megahertz. Okay, so these are the two antennas which generally comes out of it when you are actually deploying it. So <clears throat> after the PS4, which is a PSLV stage four, which is basically a, just like a few months exercise, uh, then the I, final aim is to go to the either far side of the moon or in LEO to get some more data at these frequencies. So looking at radio frequencies below 16 megahertz is not only good for, is not only a wish list for dark ages experiments, but also for galactic synchrotron emission. Nobody has looked into at this frequency how our galaxy behaves, primarily because of um, RFI and ionosphere. So this is our basic prototype experiment which was saved. So PS4 is a rounded body. If you have a deployer on top, you need a curved ground surface. It's a prototype which is uh, under testing in uh, Pune University. 
Okay, so I stop at that and take questions. Thanks. <coughs> so thank you, Dr. Dotto, for your inspiring and uh, beautiful talk. So I would like to take uh, so few questions. So any questions? Thanks, and it's actually very nice to see the seams uh, is coming up. Would you come a little bit more on the timelines and what the frequency uh, coverage and yeah. so both seams and Pratush finished their um, they were funded for the seed funding. So both of them finished their seed funding. I think talks are underway. Uh, our PS four is funded, by the way. Uh, Pratush, I'm not sure whether PS four is there in their timeline, but I think both of these uh, groups are trying to go to the um, in the next stage, the project mode. I think for Pratush, it is going maybe a faster one, uh, but we are all trying. So, what altitude and uh, where, where will, will this be flown? Our aim is to go to the moon, moon. but uh, maybe downsizing that to you may happen. We are under consideration right now. There are four um, <laughs> short listed um, projects, and the last, as far as the last AO was concerned. Insist that to Daksha uh, and uh, Singh. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so thanks, Abhiru. This was really educational. I was wondering, uh, this is a theorist's question, but uh, uh, is, is ionospheric? monitoring possible from sort of spacecraft uh, uh, just like adaptive optics uh, corrects for turbulence in optical astronomy is that a pot possibility here yeah the only thing you have to think is that the field of view for optical uh, telescope is much smaller so in that sense uh, this is a very wide field as the wavelength goes very very high, low very high it becomes very wide field and so uh, it can correct but that's why it is correcting around some region so how the ionosphere behaves within your field of view over here and over there can be different and that can be right. So radiation dependent calibration is required. But the trick over there also is that um, you need to have equal number of bright sources of more or less comparable brightness around the entire field to get a successful result. Otherwise suppose you have a very strong source can say in somewhere. No matter which area you want to solve for, everything will be driven towards that. So it's a signal to noise. Uh, <coughs> but you can create like CubeSats, which will be sending signals from multiple. That's an innovative technique. Uh, a swarm of uh, microsatellites, which will be keeping, sending tone signals in specific bands from different areas, and that's a possibility. Then you are transferring the budget head from there to something else and create, you can also create a dense uh, GPS receiver network below your uh, telescope and the same thing will happen, yeah. So, any more questions? So, let's thank the speaker. <laughs>